But you go to Iraq, um, and there are a lot of different things a doctor can do in Iraq, but you're there and, and you become, you, you get involved or you, you know, your mission involves, at least in this first tour, 2004, um, I think among the toughest um, stories, you know, within the big story of the Iraq war, Fallujah, I think is one of the, is one of the toughest sort of sub stories within that, that tough, that tough story that is the big story of, of the Iraq war. And so you end up um, right outside Fallujah, you've got the Marines in Fallujah proper, you're, you're outside, and then the, the casualties come to you. You mentioned in, in the book, Operation Vigilant Resolve. Just, can you just tell us what, that, what Operation Vigilant Resolve was? Sure, that was the military's name for the operation of uh, attacking and containing the insurgency in Fallujah, to, to uh, put it bluntly. Yeah. And they had to come up with, uh, number one, a name and then a plan. And the operation was mainly in four phases. And the initial phase was two battalion, uh, two Marine Corps battalions attacking the city from a couple different directions, a very coordinated effort. And then shortly after, a couple other battalions joined in the fight. And it was basically a street by street, house by house uh, advancement into Fallujah and securing each sector as they went forward, clearing the houses, um, fighting it out uh, very close quarters sometimes with the insurgency, encountering a number of obstacles, booby traps, streets blockaded. Uh, mortars, rockets, etc., using mosques as holdups, even using civilians sometimes uh, to to block the advancement of the Marines. So that was Operation Vigilant Resolve to take over Fallujah that had become just encumbered and um, basically controlled by about a 20,000 person insurgency. So we're talking about intense urban warfare, and I'm, I'm going through my mental files. I'm thinking, when was the last... Before this, before Iraq, um, you know, in the early 2000s, when was the last time Marines were in um, that kind of intense urban warfare? And I'm thinking of, of the battle for Wei in 1968 in Vietnam. I don't, I can't think of another time where Marines are, are in this sort of um, urban combat. If I remember correctly, you do mention in your memoir that your training before you get to Iraq does involve sort of practicing with mock-up Iraqi cities. Is that is that right? Do I have that right? Yeah, that's correct. From Camp Pendleton, the entire battalion flew to Okinawa, and the whole purpose of living on Okinawa at Camp uh, Hansen was to uh, train the Marines for the type of urban combat they would encounter in Iraq. So that was a two- to three-month stint in Okinawa prior to traveling to Iraq. And also a unique part, a part of, you know, what we did is once we finished our training in Okinawa, we flew to Kuwait. And then at that time, the battalion assembled in Kuwait and for three days convoyed up into Iraq. And uh, at later stages in the war, that just didn't happen. So that was a very a unique experience for me personally. It just it felt like I was traveling back into an ancient world for those three days heading into this very extreme environment that I knew would challenge everybody. Extreme environment in terms of combat, which we'll talk more about, but also, you know, you were living in Southern California at the time. You live in Southern California now. I know what it's like living in Southern California. It can get pretty hot there in July and August, um, but I get the feeling from your memoir that the Southern California heat didn't quite prepare you for uh, Iraqi heat. Is, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. How hot would it, I mean, do you remember ever looking at the thermometer and seeing what the... Yeah, it would, it would routinely be, you know, on the bad days, 110 into the one teens. Just intense, a very dry, dry, intense heat. The only type of heat that I can recall relating to it would be uh, out in Arizona in some of the very, you know, dry desert areas of, of Arizona. So we've talked about the sort of the Marines training there in Okinawa and you're participating in that. Um, I think I also remember from your memoir that part of your training involved working in an an emergency room. Is that right? 
That's right. Uh, and my training stemmed from medical school. Uh, for one month out of the year, we would be plucked, military students would be uh, plucked and sent out to various versions of military training to to get you ready to live a life of, of a military position. Yeah. Uh, so medical school and then even into my first year of internship at Camp Pendleton, we'd go out to uh, what they called combat uh, casualty courses and field medical school to understand the, the challenges and the unique aspects of providing medical care in the field. And then in addition to your point, um, I spent some time at USC County Medical Center with the trauma team there. That, that was speckled throughout my um, career, but that was specifically also for combat trauma training. Do you feel like that trauma training at that emergency room there at USC, did, was that particularly helpful when it comes, I mean, I imagine you're seeing all different kinds of things, car accidents, I imagine you're seeing gunshots and stabbings and things like that. Do you feel like that in particular was helpful when it comes to the kinds of wounds you describe in your memoir? Definitely, because the, the Navy had, has, and I had, and I believe still does, a relationship with USC so that they're bringing in um, naval physicians and the training is specific to what they'll need to provide field medical care. And so a lot of it is focusing on chest tubes or surgical airways or controlling massive hemorrhage uh, they have a lab with, with simulations to um, help physicians practice those procedures. And the whole goal is so that when you're in that environment where you don't have the normal support of a hospital setting or emergency room or even nurses, that it just becomes second nature, that you, you reach and you find that file in your brain where that procedure or that technique is, and you pull it out and you do it. Wow. So it was, it was very helpful. So I'm imagining, um, you know, this is a high stress, these are high stress situations in an emergency room, you've got a wound that comes in, I have absolutely no idea what it would be like, you know, to face that, let alone have to be the, the central actor in it. Um, you describe in your, in your memoir, you know, and I'm sure in your memoir, you don't describe everything that came at you. You describe, you know, I, I'm, I'm imagining, you know, kind of the, 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 major, the, the major things, but some significant <clears throat> wounds. And you also describe some, some Marines you're working on who don't make it. You describe right. uh, fellow Marines, your Navy, but fellow Marines standing around watching. And so you're performing in a couple different senses. You're performing for them. And you actually mentioned that, that, you know, if I remember right, there's one point in your memoir where you're you're wondering, you know, this looks like it's like this isn't going to work. This this Marine's not going to make it. But should I keep going? Really, for the sake of, of the Marines who are watching. Right. right. Um, so I'll, I say all of that to kind of set this up. Very, very stressful situations. Um, how 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 are they different? Um, you've got an emergency room situation come in, let's say a gunshot wound from the streets. You've got, you've got a situation that comes in from Fallujah, gunshot, so superficially they, they seem the same. Um, but how, how are these contexts different? How would you describe the difference between them? A few key things. Number one is just the environment that you're in. It's, it's, it's very extreme, and that's on a few different levels. One, you've got heat, potentially. Or it could be cold. At nighttime, it would get fairly cold. Mm. You've got a bunch of gear on. In, in most situations, when I was at the Cloverleaf, which was underneath the freeway overpass just outside Fallujah receiving casualties, mm. I would be in full combat gear, too. I'd have my Kevlar helmet on. I'd have a flak jacket on, which was pretty restrictive. I'd, ha I'd have gear on. A lot of times, I'd have my pistol. So you're just encumbered by a number of of uh, obstacles that you normally wouldn't be in a, in a hospital setting. And then you've got, in many cases, combat in the background. It wouldn't be uncommon for me to hear bombs exploding, even firefights not far off in the distance, Humvees or tanks rolling through um, the Cloverleaf, which was a little highway. So there's a lot of distractions. And then you just don't have the capabilities you do in a normal emergency room setting. We had a lot of great equipment but you have to rely on your clinical skills 
to a much higher degree than you than you would in a hospital or emergency room setting. You don't have the diagnostic capabilities like scans, ultrasounds, um, laboratory studies, uh, even some of the cardiopulmonary monitoring to, to get quick access to vital signs and things like that. So you're really trained to use the tools you have uh, and it can serve you quite well. And then you have to make quick decisions and move on. And if, if you realize perhaps you, you um, made a misstep or wish you had done something different, you have to forgive yourself and just keep going forward because you can't, you can't change that. Yeah. And then to your point of the, the, the people around you, you know, there's, there's my Navy corpsman and then there's Marines who brought their fallen brothers in and all they want to see is that you'll do everything you can. Mm. And so when, when it comes to a situation where, you know, you had mentioned one, one Marine who I knew wouldn't make it, he had a massive head wound, he was still breathing, which was just unbelievable. And I, I knew he wouldn't make it, yet we proceeded with all that efforts, a surgical airway, um, trying to stabilize him and get him to the next level because we want those guys to see that we won't do anything less for them. As you were speaking about, um, you know, responding to these wounds outside Fallujah, and then so I have that in my, I have a, an image that I formed in my mind, and then I have an image of you at work in an emergency room at USC. And then as you were speaking, you know, you've got your, you've got your Kevlar on, I'm imagining you've got um, 110 degrees outside. Uh, you didn't mention the sweat running down your face as you're trying to work on this. Although I imagine that that was probably part of the story. Yes. Uh, you do, you do mention elsewhere in the memoir, the flies and the mosquitoes, I imagine. And so that, and you, none of this stuff, dust, I imagine none of this stuff is going to be happening when you're at USC. So this is a, a much, a much more intense situation. Absolutely. And a lot of time, or in the beginning, uh, we also had to perform some procedures on the ground until we had proper stretcher and litter stands to bring them up to a, a proper height. And that was of course challenging. Well, that, that brings us to a, a photo that was taken by an Associated Press photographer, if I have it correctly, or at least the, the photo was published in the Associated Press. It has you and Marines gathered around um, the, the body of an officer, I think, who, who didn't make it. That's and right. I was surprised when I first saw that photo, what you see in the photo are the, are the boots of the Marine killed in action sort of coming out. And I was actually surprised to see him laying on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, cause I don't know why I assumed, oh, well, if there's some sort of, um, you know, the procedures he described, I assumed there'd be some sort of table or something there, but there he was on just on the ground. And that's, that's, where, that's where you worked, you worked with him. That's right. How, how long went by before you knew that that photo had been, had been published? You know, that Associated Press photographer, I didn't even know he was there. A lot of action was always happening at the Cloverleaf, people um, coming through, mostly military personnel. But apparently uh, he had been dropped off. Mirad Cesar is his name. And um, he had snapped that photo. He, uh, he and I had a brief conversation afterwards. He had approached me asking me some questions about what it was like to, um, you know, treat him and then what it was like to have a life end in defeat, so to speak. And then he was gone. And the next time I heard about that photo was from back home. It made its way into a number of newspapers and uh, magazines and things like that. And my family uh, had seen it and uh, particularly my mother. And of course had a very emotional reaction to it. And so it was a few weeks later, just it made its way to me, I believe in an email which was still, uh, we didn't have even great internet at that time. So a number of weeks later is when I found out that that photo had made it back to the States. Yeah. And so we're speaking of a journalist. There's a passage in your memoir where you, you um, sort of expressed your views about how the media um, were depicting the war in Iraq. And if I have it right, you know, you're, you're sort of, you, you have in your mind what you've actually seen, and then you have in your mind what you're hearing the media say, mm -hmm. and they don't seem to have a whole lot to do with one another, or they don't, the one doesn't really fit with the other. Is that, is that right, if I have that right? 
Yeah, and it certainly wasn't in every instance. In this particular instance, it was it was one news publication uh, about the war in Fallujah, and of course, that was the big topic in on every news station all over the world. Sure. And I was there and experiencing it firsthand. I also knew a lot of the efforts that uh, the American military made uh, to notify citizens, drop leaflets within the city, uh, have loudspeakers letting people know uh, what's going to happen and begging people to, to leave. And then I also know the, the, the horrific measures that the insurgency uh, took invading the citizen's home and using them as human shields in, in, in certain cases. So those details were very clear. And in this one particular news article, it was, uh, it was really portraying the Marines as bullies, which, which was just yeah. extremely unfair. And that was uh, tough for me to see that, I, our, that our media got it that wrong. But that was one instance. A lot of the other media was good. Yeah, I can imagine that. Well, and you were just just touching on it earlier. You you talked about you know this operation. The the purpose of this operation in Fallujah is to contain the insurgency. That's the word you use. And a couple times in your memoir, um, you know, you you describe what I call the the guerrilla way of war. You know, the insurgent way of war. You say our enemy couldn't care less that we are non-combatants providing only medical care the rules of war are meaningless to them. A number of times you describe mortar shells coming in from nowhere. Right. Um, just a feeling that the enemy is everywhere. I mean, this is an advantage insurgents have, right? You don't know who's friend or foe. The feeling right. that they're everywhere. Um, the feeling that they, in a way, can't be contained or maybe they can be contained for a short time. One of the themes that, that strikes me in your memoir in response to this, and I think that this, when you're sort of speaking about your, your own yourself and your own reactions, uh, it, it often comes up at following a description of insurgent tactics, these kinds of, you know, shells that come in from nowhere, mm -hmm. um, an enemy that does not recognize any rule of war aside from there not being a rule of war. And you, you say in this, in this one passage here, you say that you are seething over what I cannot do, fight back. Now, I mean, that's because you are a doctor, right? But, you know, I think that the theme you're describing holds generally just kind of this enemy that simultaneously is nowhere and everywhere. You know, it, may, it might feel like that. Right. You say, it's a helpless feeling taking me to dark places I have not been before. And it's a... You know, it comes up a few times in the memoir, just understandable feelings of seething, for lack of a better word, hatred or rage. Uh, it's an unanswerable question. You know, I'm going to ask you a question that I know can't really be answered. But I mean, what, you know, to the extent you can, I mean, how would you describe that sense of, of you know, whatever it is you're describing that you feel like you're being take, taken to, as you say, uh, dark places I have not been before. Yeah. Uh, and of course, this was an evolution in my, in my path, in my military career, yeah. you know, beginning with, you know, humble, idyllic, you know, training at Tulane Medical School in New Orleans, which I describe in the book is just, you know, this really wonderful experience. And I love the city and the spirit of medicine, the history of all that. And that's where I started. And I joined the Navy, knowing that I wanted that path, not knowing that uh, Fallujah and combat trauma was in my future. So I'm transported into, you know, a much more violent world than I expected. And as I'm taking each step and moving forward, I'm experiencing, you know, more intense levels of what it's like to live in the military, what it's like then to experience bombs and bullets. And within the first few days we get there, we get mortared. And for the first time in my life, I'm feeling and understanding what it's like to have someone I can't see or know out there somewhere in the darkness want to kill me. And that's a horrifying experience, frightening. Uh, yet at the same time, you're 
instinct says, you know, we'll just say a warrior come, come, you know, rise you up and the survival mechanisms, mechanisms kick in and you just want to fight back. Of course, that wasn't my role, but I carried a weapon that I mentioned I would have used it if I had to. And so you're, I'm, I'm sudden, I find myself in this position where I am trained as a healer. I'm there to, to take care of the Navy corpsmen and the Marines, uh, yet I'm amidst war. And uh, I'm not necessarily outside of it. That's one of the unique parts of my memoir is that there, haven't, there just haven't been many times where um, military physicians find themselves close to the front lines like I did. And that put us in harm's way more than I expected. Mostly small arms fire, um, indirect fire, they'd call it, mortars and rockets. And they hit a lot closer than I think any of us expected. I'm talking within yards, close enough to knock us off of our feet for the blast and the, and the uh, smoke to waft through underneath the freeway and uh, paralyze us for moments of time. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm dealing with and struggling with as I go through the memoir of how to reconcile with me being a healer, yet feeling what it's like to be attacked and want to attack back. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Um, as listening to you speak, I'm thinking of, of doctors who are further back and you say in your memoir, you know, I mean, part of my, I'm paraphrasing you, but part of my job here is, you know, the medics, they, they might do the very first stuff there on the streets of Fallujah. Then they get to Dr. Wilkes and then Dr. Wilkes's job is to, you know, sort of take care of the, I don't know anything about this stuff, but, but, you know, take care of the, the big stuff. But I mean, obviously you can't do everything there. So prepare this person for the next stage back at the hospital, the, the medevac helicopter comes in, the medevac Humvee comes in and the, the doctors further back, I suppose they can be a bit more detached, right? They can be a bit more detached, but you're describing a situation where you're, you're not just doing quick patch up as medics are at the same time, you're not doing, you know, the sort of surgical operations that are back there, but you're having to make some pretty big decisions. But even as the stuff of war is going on, you've got explosions going on, you've got the difficulty of the environment going on, you've got the knowledge that some mortar shell could come in at, at, at any time. It's a pretty stressful, I mean, it sounds like, a, like an incredibly, incredibly stressful situation. That's right, it is. And, and, you know, my role could be anything from minor wounds, uh, sh minor shrapnel wounds, or even minor gunshot wounds, or, uh, you know, other injuries, infections, things like that. And those would be the minor ones. And we might be able to treat that Marine, get him back into the fight, to major trauma, massive head wounds, RPGs that had, you know, canoed through shoulders, chest wounds requiring a chest tube or um, wounds requiring intubation or surgical airway where you need to you know cut a small opening in someone's throat essentially and get wow. an airway in there to stabilize that person to get them to the next level and that next level is usually a field surgical hospital and um, I don't want to imply that they're not also enduring their own hardships and and in harm's way because they are but yeah, the closer you are to the fight, um, the closer you are to, uh, to um, small arms fire and indirect fire. And that's where I found myself. Yeah. The, the feelings that you write about and that you describe of, um, you know, you're dealing with an enemy that does not operate according to rules of war as, as the United States Army does within its right. you know, Western tradition of war. It's an army that can't be reasoned with in any, in any way that's identifiable to us. You know, I tell my students, you know, look, if, if you have German enemy in 1945, 19, late 1944, they know they're surrounded, they know they can't win, and so they're probably going to be rational, put up their arms and surrender. And then the rules of war go, go into effect, right? Uh, the rules of how to treat prisoners. Mm -hmm. Here we're talking about a, a radically different sort of enemy and they're not wearing uniforms. So that would be a, a, another key difference. So these, these, this personal response you have to that, the, to that kind of enemy makes sense. But then you describe a, a, a time that comes where an officer, I think you've just gone to sleep and you get a knock on the door and you're told that an officer needs you 
uh, a senior officer needs you and um, the officer has you jump in, is it into the back of a Humvee or something like that or a, the back of a truck. You've got three insurgents there and you described the sort of the, the difficulty of that. Um, can, you, can you relate that, that story to us? Sure, this was late at night. Uh, we were back at our, our base, so this, this was uh, after the Battle of Fallujah had calmed down. We're back at our base, which is about a mile or two away, and uh, a patrol had captured some insurgents. Uh, they had gotten a firefight with them. And they, uh, this is uh, per protocol, had to bring them back to the base for processing. And um, the uh, battalion commander called me out uh, because we needed to determine if they had died. There were three of them. So my job, and it's pitch black, was to you know grab a little flashlight in the middle of the night and walk in the back of the Humvee and inspect these men. Uh, they were bound appropriately. Um, right so that they you know, couldn't move. And I had to inspect their wounds, listen to their, their lungs, check for uh, pupil reactions, things like that, and pronounce them yeah. dead. Uh, one was still alive, the other uh, two were dead. And it was you know, very surreal experience walking amongst these men. And I kind of described how I had to uncouple them from the living world is a, is a phrase I used and part of the reason I realized I was doing that, and some of this was an unconscious thing, was to protect myself and my heart from going into a black hole. And what I mean by that is these experiences as, as you go through, let's just call it war in general, you know, it, it starts taking little pieces of you. And it's, you know, it's an experience that's very visceral and uh, challenges parts of your faith uh, of course, it challenges your, you know, even hope, you know, keeping hope for you're going to get through this and get back home. Mm. And so you have to protect yourself is really uh, what I'm getting at. And uh, that included just protecting my mind and, and my heart from losing sympathy and empathy for mm. humanity because mm -hmm. you're, you're fighting this enemy that you, you know is, is horrible and has inflicted a lot of pain on you, sometimes their own people. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're there, you hope for the right reasons to help um, good Iraqis in this case, yeah. yet yeah. it's war. And uh, seeing other humans die is always a humbling experience. And ultimately, you, you don't necessarily come away you know, better for that. You come away better because you're serving the country but seeing other humans suffer, it, it starts to wear you down and take little pieces of you. So I'm trying to protect my heart, protect my empathy for other humans um, by uncoupling them from the living world and just telling myself, I'm doing my job here. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to get through this day and the next and the next until I earn the right to go home and trying to keep myself intact, my heart and my mind. Yeah, so you, you end up those comments with a reference to the heart and the mind, you know, sort of losing a, losing a, a sense of, 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 of self. You do use the, the phrase in the memoir, you say that, you know, this war experience changed you forever. Um, how, how so? So here we are, now you're writing about 2004, you, go, you do go back to Iraq in 2008, and, and I want to hear about that briefly, but we're focusing here on 2004. So, you know, at this point, we're, what, 16 years removed from that, roughly, 16, 17 years. Looking back, how would you say that the Donnelly Wilkes of 2021 is different from the Donnelly Wilkes of 2003 as a result of being outside Fallujah in 2004? I would say that, as with any intense experience like that, it's not if you will be changed, it's how will you be changed. And that could be for better or for worse. And with war, and for me, it, it was both. Uh, I don't go into extreme detail, but I certainly had my challenges uh, when I came home for a couple of years and after my two deployments with de-escalating, you know, when you're living in, the, in a war zone, you're living at a 10 out of 10. And so, it takes time for you to understand how to 
train your body, your heart, your mind to live in a normal environment. Uh, so going through that, going through the two deployments, going through um, a different part, a region of the world, trying to understand this region of the world, it certainly helped me had a broader, have a broader um, insight into humanity in general, a different culture, a different way of life that I didn't understand at all before encountering that way of life. Yeah. And on the other side of it, the good part is it gave me more empathy for, um, for my fellow man and woman, mm. a deeper understanding of the differences that, uh, uh, you know, make us human and not that I have to agree with all those differences or necessarily understand them, but that they are there. And it behooves you to try to understand them, put yourself in someone else's shoes, because mm -hmm. I certainly had my, you know, preconceived notions about um, uh, different walks of life and different parts of the world. And I'm not just talking about Iraqis. I'm talking even about the men that I deployed with. Yeah. So it gave me a broader sense of self and others. And, and then to really fast forward, it helped me with, with my personal understanding of of who i am and who i was and what was most important to me in being my best self and i touch on that in the final chapter and those you know three key elements to me were getting your heart and mind balanced getting your body fit grabbing a fistful of courage and then go after it and that's kind of you know the motto that i summarized my experiences and part of that heart and mind of course was my spiritual journey that i talk about in the book uh, that evolved for me over time. Yeah, and I, so I want to return to that. I'll just have a few a few more questions for you. Um, and actually, I wanted to ask because you do. There is a at least I I pick up in the memoir a certain tension. Um, a few times comes up where you know you talk about this under these understandable feelings of anger and even hatred for the sure. same. You know that that makes sense. Um, it's not hard to understand how that could be. And then, um, and I think this happens a couple times, within a couple paragraphs, there's a reference to, you know, the love of God and, and, and that. And it's an interesting contrast. So I do want to come back to that. Um, but I want to pick up on, on something you, you said a minute ago. When you're in the world of war, when you're that close to Fallujah, you know, you're living, you're living at 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. It's amped up all the time, right? Yeah. And if yeah. you're not completely amped up, you're, you're ready to be amped up all, all the sure. time. And then you come home, and I know that life in Southern California can be stressful, but, but not very often as it is outside of Fallujah. That's right. Do you find yourself in the position that that's, um, a number of war veterans I've talked to over the years have said, they've said, you know, that was a terrible thing but there's also something about it that I really miss. There was a, not that the decisions I had to make were easy, but they were simple, if that makes sense. Hard decisions, but simple. Pretty clear what I have to do here. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the contrast, I think it's in this movie, the, the, the Hurt Locker, where this guy comes home from Iraq. I don't know if you know the movie or not, but this guy comes home from Iraq. And I've heard this, I've seen this depicted not only in this movie, but I've heard veterans say this. Then they go to the grocery store and they're in the cereal aisle and they're confronted with like 70 different brands of cereal and they have to decide. And it seems like such a stupid decision. And the, the movie in the Hurt Locker shows that he's back in Iraq, you know. Is there something about, as, as hard as that was, um, is there something about it that you miss every once in a while? Yes, yes, for sure. And you, you touched on some points that are, are very true and that I have also found to be true. I could never have explained this without having the experience. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, there is, there is something very soothing about a simple day-to-day -day life where you, you, you wake up every day and there aren't a lot of questions about what you're going to do. You know what your job is. You know what you've been trained to do. And uh, if you're not sure what step is next, uh, someone's going to tell you, you know, your commanding officer mm. and you've got a mission and um, you're, you're there to complete that mission. And, and, and everything is important. 
right? right. I mean, there's, there's no ambiguity like, oh, I've got this wounded guy from Fallujah. Does this matter? I mean, it's a stupid question. Of course it matters. Is that part of it too? It's just like everything you do, I mean, I understand the military can be bureaucratic, but once you're in the war zone and once, once it's on, pretty much everything is important, right? Everything matters. And you come back to the civilian world and, you know, it's not that it's meaningless, but it doesn't, there's just not that intensity of meaning. Is, is that kind of get at it a little bit? Yes, it does. And, you know, I remember for me, it would be, I'm watching TV and, you know, some very, what I'd call superficial, maybe commercials or maybe shows, mm -hmm. they come on and I'm sitting there thinking, how, how could this superficial item be elevated to what it is when it's just so unimportant to me in the big picture of what uh, I went through being selfish or what these men and women are still going through and reconciling that uh, and not knowing how to really do it completely would cause problems. I'd get angry. I'd be maybe irritable or, or talk to my wife, you know, yeah. in a tone that she didn't deserve. And even more than that, to go back to another point you made, you have so much, we'll, I'll, I'll call it meaning and fulfillment on a day-to-day -day basis when you're, you know, when you're in the military, even stateside, but especially when you're deployed and you, you don't realize it, but you derive such a huge sense of self-worth and accomplishment and pride from that day-to-day -day environment and these men and women that you're with accomplishing sometimes monumentous goals. And then you come back to this tranquil life that you are elated to be back to and love and, and, and peace and, and good sleep and good food and things like that. You come back to this and finding that same level of meaning and self-worth and importance in that, that stateside life, that civilian life is very challenging because you, you can't just flip that switch that you had in that combat environment and find that sense of self-worth. And so you'll just, to your point, you'll find a lot of veterans talk about that in different ways and how challenging that can be. And in many cases lead to, you know, problems being back home, combat stress, PTSD and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, as we wind down, I, I did want to ask you about what, what you mentioned and that is your, your spiritual life. You have a, an experience there, a spiritual experience, I think you described as kind of a spiritual awakening. Um, let me let me pitch the, the, the question to you this way. Let me set it up this way. Um, there's this expression, you know, war is hell, I think co co coined during the, the, the Civil War. And if the basic definition of hell, you know, however folks think of that, but if the basic definition of hell is the absence of God, then we can take that statement to mean war is the absence of God. This is a place, this is a, this is a part of reality that God really doesn't have anything to do with, right? So I'm not asserting this, it's just, just an idea. But I, I'm, I'm reminded of a memoir I read from a guy who went to Afghanistan. And he would say that before he'd go out on a mission, which could possibly lead to combat, he would say a prayer saying goodbye to God and that he'd be back in touch when the mission was over. Mm -hmm. Sort of this idea of war as a God-free zone. Um, so now, that's obviously not what you're describing, but what you're describing is something that is actually a lot more complicated, um, or somehow in your mind, there's a loving God at work, and then there's also all of this horrific stuff. So I'm not asking you to resolve, you know, like one of the most central difficult yeah. questions human beings have been struggling with for thousands of years. But I'm just interested in hearing how you think about this your, yourself, because you do mention a number of times, you know, you do re refer a number of times to a loving God in the context of this really awful situation. How do you, how do you work that out in your own mind? For me, I've always been, we'll say spiritual. I was, you know, raised in the Catholic church when I was a fairly young man. I kind of sought out, uh, uh, non non denominational Christian um, church and and youth group and that helped me connect um, God and Jesus into my life and um, helped me translate it into action and meaning in my life. So that was as a young man. 
And that, that was with me, you know, through my young twenties and into medical school and uh, into the military yet, you know, there, there were, there was work that I needed to do in my, you know, personal journey uh, with God. And I knew that. So I end up in Iraq and Fallujah. And uh, I remember thinking to myself, how did I end up here? And Mm. again, I I know the answers and I know the choices that I made. And I even know that along each step that I felt God's presence and that he was with me. But then I get to this point where, and and I say this directly, I start having some serious problems with, um, with where I am and asking God some serious questions and even angry. And that's okay. That, that, that's okay to have those feelings to, to, to be angry, ask questions and kind of duke it out with God, so to speak, because we're human and, and that's how we were put on this earth. And, you know, he gave us free will. So I'm having these struggles and, in 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 dealing with the, the, my position, you know, that, that I feel like I found myself in the, the depth of combat trauma that I'm seeing I'm realizing that I'm in this pinnacle event, this, this um, one of the most violent events of the entire war. I didn't know it quite at that time, but I knew it was bad. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm struggling with that and it's eating at me. And I know that I need to somehow release a little bit of this tension that I'm bringing to the plate of trying to figure it out while I'm there because I know I'm not going to. And so there was one night, and this was after Lieutenant Jackson died, where I'm in the back of my ambulance in the Humvee, and it's a pretty intense night. There's battles going on in Fallujah. I can hear it. There's Humvees coming through. Sleep's horrible. And uh, I'm just kind of drowning in, in anger, fear, trying to figure things out. And I just realized, hey, if I don't, if I don't do something here, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a problem, you know, handling my own emotions. So I get down on the floor of the the Humvee. And I just tell myself, I've got to do something meaningful here. And it has to, it has to be real. And so I just ask for a release and uh, I'm, I'm praying and saying, all right, God, I don't understand this, why you brought me here, even some of my own emotions, but I'm going to give it up. I'm going to release it because I have no other choice. And I feel myself do it. And uh, over the next hour, I feel a weight has been lifted and that I don't know that I'm going to make it through and be safe and um, or have any guarantees, but I know that I've just released what I can't control. And so for me, that that was the major turning point spiritually for me in, in my journey. I never felt the absence of God as in hell. I can see how someone, you know, could come to that point. Sure. Um, but I was able to just release what I couldn't control, knowing that I was going to be okay. I didn't know what okay meant, but I knew I was going to get through it uh, and that I would just get to the next day and the next day and the next, and that, that God did have me there for a reason. I couldn't explain it, but I knew that I was there for a reason, and that did sustain me the next day and through the rest of my deployment and to even this you know, day in my life. It sustained me and helped me understand um, God's role in my life. Would it be accurate to say that your sense is that God was there despite the nonsense that human beings had created, but you know, that the nonsense wasn't his doing. This was, you, you mentioned free will human beings, you know, what you're dealing with is a, is a, is a a human tragedy that's unfolding because of, stupidity you know but god is there despite that is that sort of the the thing you're you're describing yes uh, it is i i believe he's always there despite um the the tragedies around us despite what you know happens in our in our humanness and how that plays out in the world uh, i do believe he's there i want to ask you about captain edge um and we'll end with that but i do want to ask you just briefly your, your memoirs about your tour in 2004 um, but you go back in 2008. Can you can you just briefly summarize that second tour in 2008 for us? Sure, sure. Uh, after I came back from Fallujah, I finished. Uh, I had a two-year stint with the Marines at that time, and then I went back to residency training at Camp Pendleton. Finished up my um, residency training, uh, so I uh, could obtain board certification in family medicine. 
And then I uh, was transferred to Port Wainini, which was a pretty good duty station. Uh, I believe part of the reason I, I received that good duty station is because of my combat deployment. So I get to Port Wainimi in, you know, Oxnard, California, and uh, the commanding officer says, hey, things are looking pretty good. I think you'll be stationed here for a while. And two weeks later, he brings me back and basically says, hey, doc, I'm sorry. We got to send you back to Iraq. Wow. So that was a big blow. Yeah. Of course, stirred a lot of emotions. Okay. Katie and I were married at this point, even planning a family, you know, uh, you know trying, wanting to try to have a, a baby. Got to put all that on hold, and um, I need to enter some more uh, combat training. I need to go out to Camp Lejeune and uh, deploy with the Marines back to Iraq out of there. Wow. And so, yeah, you know, just uh, kind of dealing with knowing what was going to happen now. I was a little naive in my first deployment. The second, I know what's going to happen. I know where I'm going. And so wow. that, was, that was pretty challenging for, for me and Katie. Yeah. And so fast forward, I get to Iraq, this time out in Al-Qaim on the Iraqi-Syrian border, kind of at a field ER. Um, I'll, call it, I'll call it level two or echelon two versus echelon one when I was in Fallujah, a little safer place. Sure. Very austere, though, out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I find myself trying to figure out how I'm going to get through the time of deployment. Some of the Marines will call it the suck of deployment because there is a lot of downtime and, and uh uh, filling those hours is is very challenging uh, for 10 months straight. And so I pull out my field journal from Fallujah and I start going through it and I decide, you know, I'm going to write a book about that experience from Fallujah because at, the, at that time I, I knew it was a unique uh, time, not only because of the intensity of that battle, but for uh, military physicians I knew it was unique. And so I wrote the book, the origins of the book on that second deployment. Okay, 2008 in Iraq, things had calmed down, right, to, to a degree. You're there, when you're there for the first time, it's, it's pretty intense. That's right. Um, so things have calmed down. Let's, let's wrap it up with um, uh, you telling us about Captain Ed. Now, you, you mentioned other folks in the book. You mentioned a Lieutenant Jackson a few minutes ago, but that's a pseudonym. Um, mm -hmm. you, didn't, you didn't want to give the names of... of um, of the Marines who, who died, the one exception being Captain Edge, whose death, um, you know, is public. Um, can you just tell us, tell us about him and uh, tell us about that story? Sure. Uh, Captain Jamie Edge was one of the uh, Marine Corps officers who I became close with fairly quickly. He was uh, one of those kind of big personalities. Also, you know, po poster boy Marine, probably 6'3 or so. He might be an inch taller and be mad at me, but um, uh, also his facade was just perfect Marine Corps facade, big kind of framed jaw and face. Mm. Uh, very animated guy, fun guy to be around, but, mm. but a Marine Corps officer, you know, to the T. And so he welcomed me uh, into the battalion and for, you know, a Navy Navy officer coming in to a bunch of Marine Corps officers who have a different path, uh, you know, it can be a little intimidating. So it, it was it was very kind of him to welcome me into that brotherhood. So we become close pretty quick and we go through the deployment. Uh, I, I describe our bond as we are leaving Fallujah in the middle of the night. We have to travel through the desert and it was just horrific for seven to eight hours in the back of this Humvee mm -hmm. and the outskirts of Fallujah are in the distance and we kind of are, are, are having a little moment, a little toast to leaving this place. And we just talked for hours uh, on, that, on that convoy. And then, uh, you know, we make it back and we make it home. And then the battalion, once we get back home to the States, a lot of people turn over. And that's common in battalions. People come and go. He stays with 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. And he's given his own company of Marines, which is something that he wanted uh, dearly. So he's got his own company of Marines within the battalion. And immediately they're gearing up again to deploy. Right, I'm, uh, I'm with a, a new unit. Uh, we still kind of keep in touch. I get to run out to um, the parade deck, which is the big cement asphalt area when they're leaving to go back to Iraq. And we have a great um, moment before he boards the buses and they head back to Iraq. Mm. And then it's only a couple weeks later, uh, I received word that Captain Edge was going up on top of a building, uh, I believe it was, it was in Al Ramadi, 
in Ramadi um, to uh, they're in a fire. His Marines are in a firefight and he needs to uh, to get some uh, positional uh, insight or wherewithal to the, what's happening in the battlefield. So he's uh, going up top uh, to uh, be in, in charge of uh, what's going to happen and where's how his Marines are going to maneuver. And uh, a sniper uh, took him out. And that's kind of, you know, the details I'll give there. And so it's just a very, you know, tragic event. Of course, any Marine going down is a big deal. You know, Marine Corps company commander um, is, is, a, is, a, is a bigger deal um, just because, you know, that's one man in charge of that whole company and it's hard to replace that person quickly. Right. And he was just this wonderful, wonderful person and huge personality and credit to everything that he did. Uh, so there's a, just a nice tribute to Captain Edge and uh, his family at the end of the book. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll dedicate this, uh, this discussion to uh, Captain Edge. And Love thank it. you very much, uh, Dr. Wilkes, for taking the time. Thank you for writing your memoir. I appreciate it. I, I agree. I mean, by now I've, met, I've read a lot of memoirs and I've talked to a lot of um, folks who served in the world of war, I don't can't think of another case where I've talked to a doctor who was this close to combat. And so I, I think you're right to say it's, it's a pretty unusual experience. So thank you very much for the memoir. Thank you for this time. I really appreciate it. You bet. You bet. Thanks for that insight. Thanks for what you do. Thank you.